Nikana, you covered the Kenyan election in 2007. Yes. And, you know, we had an election last year in Kenya, two very different elections, mm. one very violent, one not so violent. One where people said the country was almost on the brink of collapse, the other one where people mm. said, you know, they pulled back, they've, they've re-established the, the themselves yeah. as being able to, to run elections. What were the different roles of the media in those two very different elections? Um, I, I think there, there was a learning experience. Um, uh, just to summarize, I've actually covered four elections in Kenya. I don't <laughs> know quite how it's worked out, but I just have. Um, so I have the, the, the elections during the Moy era that I can compare to as well. Um, and I think what you <coughs> saw in um, uh, two uh, last year was um, you saw a learning from the experiences of 2007, 2008. 2007 and 2008 uh, will go down in history as probably the most violent elections in, in Kenyan history. Um, and um, I, over 1,300 people were killed, possibly many more than that, because there's a lot of unlogged things that <coughs> happened. Um, uh, and I think uh, what, what we saw was that the, the press, there was um, an awful lot of commissions of inquiry set up after, after that had happened, an examination of what, what had happened, who was responsible, um, and the, the press was partly criticized, the Kenyan press. Um, the, the press in Kenya li liberalized um, uh, in the early, I mean, it's been a gradual process, 2002 onwards. And so they, they had sprung up, you'd had the, the rigid rule of the, of the state and sort of the sycophantic coverage of Moy for many years, and then it becomes all these private radio stations start getting licenses. Uh, citizen radio starts. It's much. Some of its uh, vernacular radio stations get licenses, um, and they're trying to educate people. Also, talk to them about issues that matter to them. Um, uh, so that had exploded, and then you had uh, a, a very feisty press um, with lots of different outlets and lots of different newspapers. But there was a feeling that they had played their role in the violence of 2002, uh, 2008. Um, uh, that especially the vernacular radio stations were criticized. CAS FM was the Kalenjin um, vernacular radio station, but there was also some reference to Kameme, which was the Kikuyu vernacular radio station, and uh, other ones, and the Luo uh, Kenyan station. And that these were inciting people to, you know, pick up their weapons and go out, and the, the elections are being stolen. Um, and go out and make your <laughs> and make your presence felt, um, uh, and there really was a feeling that uh, there were a lot of comparisons made towards Rwanda and the role played by the uh, Radio Mil Colleen, which used this extremely um, uh, derogatory, humiliating language, referring to Tutsis as cockroaches, and cleaning the brush, cleaning cleaning the the, the weeds. Um, and that kind of language was being used again. Um, and um, I think people felt, if we're not careful, this country is going to descend into civil war, and we're going to see this kind of killing that we saw in Rwanda. Um, so uh, the ICC, the International Criminal Court, um, CAS, the, he uh, the head of operations of CAS FM, jo Joshua Arup, um, uh, Sorry, m suddenly my... Joshua Arup sang. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's actually one of the, the four defendants in front of The Hague. So he's, it's very interesting that, you know, he is one of the four key cases that has gone, gone through for, for what CAS FM did in uh, the Kalenjin station. Um, uh, and at the time, uh, I think after that experience, the Kenyan press uh, media got together uh, and they said... We, we can't go down that route again, we, you know, at the next election. We have to, to save ourselves from the brink. What can we do? We have to be more responsible. We mustn't throw petrol on the fire. We know that ethnicity uh, and the way in which the political landscape tends to polarize around in ethnic groups, uh, you know, th this is, these are volatile elements and we mustn't add to them. So they sort of adopted a gentleman's uh, agreement um, and one, one of the agreements was we're, we're not going to do live coverage of, of, of uh, potentially um, inflammatory um, moments. Um, things will be quietened down, you know, there will be time lags, it will allow people to digest. 
Um, uh, and so we, we went into uh, the 2013 election. In, with that determination, there was a very high awareness of the issue of hate speech. Uh, and uh, a lot of uh, techies got together uh, and there were programs launched to systematically monitor hate speech, which tends to be in vernacular languages, Facebook, the radio stations, internet. <coughs> Um, so I think there's been an awful lot of, of study and attention, and, and it was all aimed at preempting, pre making sure it didn't, didn't happen again. Um, I'd also like to say that, that while there were very good intentions behind this new determination, we shouldn't <coughs> be too naive. There was also um, the way in which the, the politics configured themselves meant that some of the key media empires in Kenya uh, were mustering around the Jubilee Coalition that um, grouped Uhuru Kenyatta and William Ruto together, challenging Raila Odinga in the ODM group. Um, so, uh, I mean, you have the Daily Nation, which has the news, uh, newspaper and television and radio uh, empire. Uh, traditionally, um, uh, a very Kikuyu-heavy uh, media empire. Uh, many of the key <coughs> people high up in the echelons of, um, of the nation ended up going into politics and now stand, uh, stood in the elections themselves. Um, and just very close traditional ties to that community. So they were going to tend to be in favor of the Jubilee campaign. Um, and at the same time, we had the standard media empire. Uh, the standard, it's uh, you know a sort of open secret that the Moy uh, family has, uh, you know, controls the standard. Um, and uh, so they were always going to be um, a sort of pro kalenjin group. Um, and uh, eventually they mustered behind, um, yeah, I mean, not eventually, they, they, were, they were supporting the Ruto campaign. Um, so um, these very powerful um, empires were backing uh, Jubilee. Um, uh, and uh, we're not likely to be that interested in really polemical um, coverage uh, that was sympathizing, favoring, supporting the Rilo Dinga campaign. Um, and I think this, this is sort of my, my take of what happened was that uh, a slightly false narrative set in where the media sort of lambasted and flagellated itself, the, the Kenyan media. <laughs> Um, and it was accepted that they have behaved terribly irresponsibly and, and were very, you know, very much in the wrong over what they had done in 2007, 2008. Um, and I've often been slightly perplexed by this, and I went back to the WACU report before coming here this evening, and the WACU report was carried out by Philip Wacky, a Kenyan judge, uh, and is, you know, a great touchstone a piece of work into the election and the election violence of 2007 uh, is 519 pages. And I thought, I'll just see what he said about media uh, coverage and the role it played in that violence. And they're eight pages out of 519. Mm -hmm. So I in Wacky's <coughs> eyes, the media did not play a very big role. And what his report focuses on instead, quite rightly so, is the systematic instrumentalized use of violence men going around in trucks, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, political leaders who paid. Uh, there were meet <coughs> meetings in the hotels. Uh, there were truckloads organized. There were machetes handed out and payments handed out to young men who didn't have jobs and who were from the right ethnic group for that particular <laughs> um, contest. Um, and in my view, that's what created you know, that's what's responsible for the killings. And the media was actually a, a bit of a sideshow. But it certainly got a lot of attention, partly because of the self-flagellatory attitude. Um, so uh, what, come the 2013 elections, um, it was a very strange coverage that resulted from this hypersensitivity <coughs> to the role the media was playing. Um, and I, I think... Uh, I, I, it was very obvious, I spent a lot of time at the counting center run by the Electoral Commission, the IEBC, which was a round counting center. It was a former dance hall. Um, and the way that the, the Kenyan television stations had set it up led to this very strange coverage because they were going for American coverage. 
and they had these incredibly slick studios which were all outside the counting center because of course they couldn't be inside um, uh, the, the tallying center, rather the place where the, the results were being announced. So they were all outside with their generators and their slick presenters wearing wonderful outfits and all their pundits who were doing sort of 24 hour news more or less. Uh, and inside were um, the people, the, the, uh, uh, the IEBC uh, officials would come out and read the results or, or tell us what was going on. And there was a bevy of uh, photographers in front of them, places where diplomats and other journalists could sit, some people down at the, uh, in, in the front, but not many local Kenyan journalists because they were all doing the slick TV coverage. And what happened is that the electoral process um, immediately unraveled uh, as soon as the counting began. The, the vote itself was very calm, wonderfully conducted. People waited for six, seven, eight, nine hours in the sun, as, as I've seen so many times in Kenya. They behaved impeccably. And when the counting started, the whole thing began to unwind. Um, the, tra the electronic transmission, which was supposed to have sorted out all these problems, didn't work. There, there hadn't been enough batteries. They were, the, the vote was conducted in schools which didn't have uh, electrical sockets, uh, and, uh, and then they couldn't relay. There hadn't been time. People hadn't been adequately trained. They didn't know how to use the machinery. So the electronic transmission uh, of results back to headquarters didn't work. It ended up being a, hand, um, a manual count. Um, and these were all very important stories if you're covering an election. And what you saw was the IEBC officials coming out and revealing these things one by one, and not a single question was asked by Kenyan uh, journalists. Uh, and I've never been able to work out because they were Western, I mean, most, most of the really awkward questions were being put by Reuters correspondents. And I've never been able to work out whether this strange stunned silence that I kept watching and thinking, what's going on? This isn't the Kenyan press I know and love, is um, whether that was because people felt that anything they said might be seen as contributing to sensationalist coverage that was then going to spark a civil war and they would be admonished by their editors, or whether, in fact, they didn't really want to know because their papers or their media outlets wanted the, the election to go s through smoothly and they knew that Uhuru and Ruta were going to win it uh, because they were basically seen as the incumbents by most of the state establishment. Uh, so it's extremely hard to tell. But as a result of this, a lot of key um, uh, stories just didn't get covered. Um, I, I, re I, I talked to a lot of people. Um, if you spoke to people in the informal settlements, the slums, or contested areas in the Rift Valley. There's huge movements of people who were f getting out before the violence was likely to hit. And they had it all organized, and they left in large, large numbers. They left areas where they felt unsafe. They sent their children, women and children, out of the cities, out of the slums. That never really got reported. A lot of the um, security provisions that were taken by the state, which is one of the reasons why we saw so little violence, was, for example, Kibera slum, which is a very heavily Luo area, was absolutely, I think it was, I'm trying to remember the actual, I think it was 4,000 security forces surrounded the slum. So there wasn't going to be any problems <laughs> coming from Kibera. Uh, and I remember speaking to Kenyan photographers who were saying, there are more people dying out there than you think in any case, but, you know, we're not allowed to report this and our editors don't want us to report this. Um, and, you know, there was a sort of a, a lockdown. And one of the phrases people use were the peace lobotomy, um, uh, the, the, the peace at all cost narrative took over. Um, and so it was a very peaceful election. There have been civil society in Kenya convinced that it was a rigged election. Um, I, uh, there, are, there are a million votes that seem to have gone missing. It's quite likely that Uhuru Kenyatta would have been the overall victor of the election, but it seems to be almost certain that there should have been a two-round election, and there wasn't one because we saw this very <laughs> puzzling after this extraordinary stalling, stopping, paralysis and counting, uh, and the ejection of election, election monitors from the tallying center. Um, in the end, the uh, result that was announced gave it one, you know, first round win to 
Uhuru Kenyatta. And what was very obvious is when you got people like Rilo Odinga saying, we don't accept these results. Um, uh, this was not because there was this ban on live coverage. Um, uh, and when they were saying, we're going to go to the Supreme Court and challenge it, it was virtually not covered. I mean, this was a massive thing. If you, you know, if you're challenging a result, a, a result if you're saying, you know, we, we don't believe the outcome, this is a massive news development. It was not treated as such by the Kenyan uh, media. It was sort of downplayed. It was sort of like we were on this sort of train tracks that were going to take Jubilee to, to victory, and that was the way the election coverage went. Um, I've probably spoken a bit too much. Um, but I, what I would just like to say is I think there are questions to be asked in, in a lot of uh, countries where you're getting... I mean, when multi-party democracy first came to many African countries, um, really, these were very peaceful elections because you saw um, one um, hardline head of state handing on to an appointed successor. So you had an election, but there was no real contest. And sometimes it was his son that he was handing on to. And I think as, as we've had one series and another series and a third series of elections, multi-party elections in many of the African countries where I've uh, covered them, you're seeing real contests taking place where the ruling establishment of the day uh, is really running the risk of losing everything and being out in the cold. And so the elections have become more volatile um, and much more bitterly fought, and I think issues of media coverage then become much more relevant. And I think one of the issues you have to face in some of the countries, uh, and Kenya for me is one of them, is can you have uh, what we in the West regard as free and you know what we all aim <coughs> to see, uh, the kind of coverage that we want here in a country where often an election will raise an issue of really you know, broad-scale civil breakdown and unrest, whether the, the future stability of that country really is at stake. <coughs> um, and so you know, those editors who sat there and said, we are not going to um, cover this in the way we, we might have liked this election, maybe they were right. There is another argument and a counter-argument to be made to that, which is, if you don't give an opposition its voice, if you suppress, muffle, uh, or sort of bypass its legitimate complaints during an election, uh, you could be storing up more trouble for the future. Because what has happened in Kenya is there is this motto that has gone around which is called accept and move on. And you see it mentioned a million times on Facebook, on Twitter, in the media. And it is basically the people who won the election who are often Kikuyu and Kalenjin telling the people who voted for Rilo Dinga, um, you know, tough titty. <laughs> <laughs> you accept and move on, accept and shut up. Um, now, if you're being told that, you know, your complaints and, you're, you know, you look at the media and you don't see your concerns being expressed there, you know, is it more likely that third time round when you think that your election is going to be stolen for the third time, that you won't um, accept the outcome and that you will see violence as the most likely output. So I just pose these as questions. I don't know what the answers are. The final thing I'd just like to say is that in the last couple of months, you've seen a really draconian media law introduced in Kenya um, uh, by parliament. Uh, it was slightly tinkered with by Uhuru Kenyatta, and now it's gone through in only slightly um, watered-down version. And it's a law that all the Kenyan newspapers are protesting at. Um, it imposes massive fines. It, it imposes a, a code of conduct. Um, and they're saying, we're not going to be able to work with this law. And I would partly say, you had it coming. Because you know if you self-censor with the, the, the willingness and the speed and the flexibility that the Kenyan media showed uh, during the 2013 elections. Um, you have signaled to a government that you are going to you know, bend over when you are asked to. And I'm afraid that the government learnt that the lesson from that 
and has then put that into le uh, you know, legislative form. So I feel that the media law that you now got in Kenya, which is causing a lot of squawks of protest, is something that the media brought upon itself, I'm afraid. Thanks very much, Michaela. 